good afternoon to all those who are tuning into BSM TV today. Um, we would like to thank God for the opportunity He has given us to hear His word one more time. Uh, this morning, the lesson, or should I, should, I say, should I say this morning, or should I say throughout the past, through BSM TV, we've, we've, we've had so many beautiful and wonderful lessons. And um, today, I hope that this afternoon, We'll have nothing less but that. We have a lesson today which talks about the new covenant and what life the new covenant brings. But before we go into that lesson, brethren, there's a, there's a portion of scripture that always inspires me when I read it. And I think as an opening thought, uh, we'll do well in considering it. Let's start from a book called Humble Hero, from the very first chapter of Humble Hero, uh, 7.3. HH 7.3. We want to hear about, uh, want to learn of God. Before we, we go on to learn anything uh, about doctrine or any other topic, we need to know who, who God is, who, who is Christ, and what's his principle in everything that he does in this world. So let's start from HH 7.3 in the beginning. 7.3. Yes. In the beginning, Christ laid the foundations of the earth, mm -hmm. his hand hung the worlds in space, and fashioned the flowers of the field. Right. He filled the earth with beauty and the air with song. He wrote the message of the Father's love on everything. This, this, this portion of scripture is just, uh, it's, it hits in a different way. It says, in the beginning, we all know that through John 1 and whatever, we know that Christ is the one who, who built this earth, who structured it. But it says, the last part of it says, he wrote the message of the Father's love on everything. Meaning that if you go to the ground, the message of the Father's love is there. If you go to the trees, the message of the Father's love is there. If you go to humans, if you go to animals, the message of the Father's love is written in the creation. We want to see where it says, now, sin marred the perfect work. We want to read. Now. Yeah. Sin is mud, God's perfect work, mm -hmm. yet that handwriting remains. Do you hear that? Sin has mud, that, that message that was written on every creation. But that handwriting remains even today. Scripture tells us that it's been 6,000 years since the beginning of this world. That handwriting is still imprinted everywhere. You want to see how it is? It says, except. Except for the selfish human heart. Right. Nothing lives just for it's itself. Itself. Mm -hmm. Every tree and shrub and leaf pours forth oxygen, without which neither people nor animals could live. Mm. And people and animals in turn support the life of tree and shrub and leaf. Did you hear that? Apart from the selfish human heart. Do you see how strong that is? Apart from... Isn't it everything was created by God? But why is this, the human heart, not have that imprint anymore? That's a disturbing thought, ain't it? But it says everything apart from the selfish human heart. There's nothing that lives just for itself. The plants there, we know that for them to grow, they take from the sun, they take water, they take carbon dioxide from humans. So do you see every single thing works into... Even the worst person, the vilest offender on earth, is still doing that divine plan which is made from the beginning of this world. Do you see that? Yeah, let's read. The ocean mm -hmm. receives streams from every land, mm -hmm. but it takes only to, to give, mm -hmm. to give back. Right. The mists rising from it fall in showers to water the earth so that plants may grow and bud. Mm, do you hear that point? The mists, where does mist come from? From oceans. <laughs> Evapor we all know geography. Evaporation condensation into a cloud that cloud moves and where does it go to water plants or to even just give water because when the water falls on the earth it falls in and goes underneath and becomes fountains in which we drink so everything has this divine message on it let's read it let's read it the angels of glory mm. find their joy in giving they bring light from above mm. Moving upon the human spirits to bring the lost into fellowship with Christ. Let's go to point six, seven point six. Sin began in self-seeking. Mm -hmm. 
Lucifer, the covering cherub, wanted to be first in heaven. Mm -hmm. He tried to draw heavenly beings away from their creator and win honor to himself. So this, this is the, what shall I say? This is the story of life all. See, the, at first, there was this message of God written on everything. Then sin began when self-seeking. Just, just comprehend that yourself. Like, we, 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 work, we work in this world, especially because from generations before, it's just been sinful people, sinful people. None of us have been righteous. But this lesson is going to teach us that though we cause sin in our own self, Christ still further writes more to that message that he brought in the first place. Everything right now is functioning because of Christ in the first place. But what we came to ruin that divine pattern. But God still on top of that writes more for us in order for us to be saved. So now we want to read, um, we had plans to read about Solomon, but we'll just go diving straight into our message and begin this afternoon. Let's start from um, 2SR 78.2. The message that we all have, the, the question that we all have individually is, what must I do to be saved? That's everything that everyone wants to know that, whether you're religious or not, everyone wants to know how they'll be saved. Because we are told that at the end, the world's going to come to an end sooner or later. And everyone has that in mind. So how are we going to be saved? 2SR 78.2. 78.2. Yes. No one is saved mm -hmm. because he may admit the evidence of truth. Right. Or because or because he may belong to the right church or creed. Did you hear that? No one is saved because they admit to an evidence of truth. Many times we think that because I belong to such and such a church, I'm going to be saved. Or many times we think that because I've accepted this message, I'm going to be saved. But here we are told no one is saved because of any outward thing they would do. Let's see how we are saved. Be um, yeah, it is only. It is only by an experience of his own, based upon evidences of truth, received, received into the heart, mm -hmm. that can renew the mind and, and regenerate the soul, so that he can walk in newness of life. This is the whole equation. Nothing that we do for ourselves, and we'll see that in the next quotation we'll read. But nothing that we can do outwardly will help us to be saved. But when the message given to us by the mercy and grace of God is given before our faces. When we take it in, when we practice it, we walk in a new life. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? So this is basically, this is the whole equation of salvation, which we're going to ponder on deeper in this uh, lesson. Let's go on to BEST, October 25, 19, uh, 1897, paragraph 4, where it says, Luther toiling. B E S T. Yeah. Luther toiling. Luther, mm -hmm. toiling on his knees right. upon the so called holy stays in Rome, mm -hmm. was trying to punish sin out of his flesh. Mm -hmm. But when he heard the voice speaking, the just shall live by faith, he began to learn of a power able to set him free. So we know of Martin Luther, right? And we know in those times there was the stairs that Christ walked with, transported to, to Rome, and all those type of things. But it says Luther, when walking up these stairs, he was trying to banish sin from himself. How, how was he trying to banish sin? He thought by walking on the very stairs that Christ walked, that will banish sin out of him. But it says he still did not find peace. Though walking on the very steps, this is, no one in this world has ever done this. Very little amount of people have given the opportunity to walk exactly where Christ has stepped. But he's done this, but he still didn't find peace. So this is what we want to see now. Where did peace come from, or where can peace come from? This is what we all want to search for this lesson. Let's go on to our next scripture, which is found in um, 8TR 79.1. 79.1. This first covenant mm -hmm. reaches from the time it was ordained to the imminent and final ingathering of the 12 tribes as a kingdom. And yet, though never invalidated by God, 
its validity has been persistently negated by the New Testament Church. Right. So we know, we all know that in times past, in the Old Testament, there was the covenant given in that time. And in Jeremiah 31, verse 31 to 34, we are told that in the last days, God is going to set up a new covenant. So this is the lesson that we want to see through today. We want to see why is there need, firstly, for a new covenant. We know that the animal sacrifices were taken away, and uh, many of us now, if we ask, they say we are now in the new covenant. But we want to see, are we in the new covenant at this moment of time? That's the point of this lesson. Let's read, let's start that paragraph once again. The first. The first covenant mm -hmm. reaches from the time it was ordained mm -hmm. to the imminent and final ingathering of the 12 tribes as a kingdom. Right. So the very first covenant that was given by God spans from, says, the imminent and final ingathering of the 12 tribes of the kingdom. So from the time it was given up until the ingathering of the people to be a nation, not at the end, when they became a nation. Let's read on. And yet, though never invalidated by God, mm. its validity has been persistently negated by the New Testament church mm. and its sanctity, mm -hmm. violated by both the Old and the New Testament churches until this very day. Right. So, as the people failing their promise have broken God's commandments, they thereby also have broken the covenant that God had made with their fathers. So, the, God made a covenant when the children of Israel came out of Egypt. God made a covenant with them and gave them what to do, yeah? But this was never invalidated by God. Because even the people of Israel at that time broke the covenant. And even us who are living in this time, we still break the covenant. So this is why there's a need for a new covenant. But we want to see when that starts and when we should prepare for that new covenant. Many of us in this world, we believe that now we are in the time of the new covenant. So we don't need the law, we don't need the statutes, we don't need the judgments. Well, now we are in the time of the new covenant. But if you want to see, are we in the time of the new covenant yet? Let's read our next scripture. It's found in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1. Verse 1. Verse 1. Now, of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. Mm -hmm. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty of the heavens, mm -hmm. a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. Right. So now we want to study this new covenant, right? So it says, Paul says, now of the things that we have spoken, we have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesties in heaven, a minister of the true tabernacle. Why does he say the true tabernacle? Why does he say the true tabernacle? Because this is Paul, right? Who came after the cross. After the first covenant was established. Do you see that? So why is he saying of the true tabernacle, which God pitched without man? In times past, we know that Abraham gave tithes to who? Melchizedek, the priest. So what, he's, what Paul is saying now that we have is that we don't have a priest who is on earth, but we have him who is in the heavenly tabernacle. So this is why we need to take this in note. When we continue to read, we'll see that, okay, this is why he says the true tabernacle. Let's read on the next verse, verse 3. For every high priest mm -hmm. is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices. Mm -hmm. Wherefore, it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. Mm -hmm. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, right. seeing that, they are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things. So, now, why is this why is this priest called a priest then? Because we know that firstly, Abraham was sending his tithes to the heavenly priest. Okay. And then what about in the time where the priesthood came back on earth, came to earth? There was a priest sending tithes where? And doing offerings where? To heaven so in this time then where are we left where's the priest to do all of that we know that is in heaven so that means there's an offering in heaven do you see why we say there's a gathering of people that the feast are meant to be kept It's because now there's no longer any material sacrifices that we're making but the sacrifices are us we are the sacrifices of this new priesthood so this is why Paul says 
we've got a much higher priest now, a much excellent ministry, because the priesthood that we have now is of the true tabernacle. It's God himself offering us as, our, as gifts. So let's, let's read on what Paul has to say. Let's read verse 5 one more time. Who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things. Yes. As Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. Mm -hmm. For see, saith he, mm -hmm. that thou make all things according to the pattern should thee in the mount. So now we know when Moses made his, we know that there, that's the old covenant there. When Moses made his tabernacle on here, we know that is the old covenant. So now we want to look continuously which one is the new covenant and what is it characterized with. Verse 6. Verse 6. But now hath he ordained, obtained a more excellent ministry. Right. By how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon the promises. This is a point that we need to take carefully. It says, hath he obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant. Mm -hmm. There's two things here. There's the ministry, then there's a the covenant. Many times when we look in, in, in Bible history and what what, we merge these two to be in the same thing. We say the old covenant is the one with the sacrifices and the statutes and the feasts, merging them into one thing. But these are two separate things. Paul is able to distinguish that these two things are different. There is the more excellent ministry, the ministry, and then there's the new covenant. Now we want to see why these things are separate. And what period are we in at this moment of time? Verse 7. For it is. Verse 7. For if. Mm -hmm. For if that first covenant had mm -hmm. been faultless, right. then should no place have been sought for the second. Right. So if the first covenant had been faultless, then no place should have been sought for the second. Meaning that the first covenant... Let's read on. Before I spoil anything, but let's read on. But we just want to keep this focused that there's a ministry and the covenant. These are two separate things that we need to keep separate for now. Let's read on. For finding fault with them, right. he saith, Behold the days come, said the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel mm -hmm. and with the house of Judah. Um, are we seeing this the same, guys? Are we seeing this the same? A new covenant has been made. So he said, if the first had not been faultless, there were no need for second. But was the ministry faultless? The ministry, was it faultless? Or should I say the ministry was faultless? It was faultless. It didn't have any fault. So now this is why I ask, why do we say that there's no need for the statutes which were involved in the ministry? There's no need for the judgments, for the law. Many Christian don't nowadays, many denominations, they preach that we, know, we don't need the commandments anymore. For we have Christ. By faith we are saved. But no, that's not the point. If we separate the ministry and the covenant, we would see that it was not the ministry that was at fault, but it was the covenant that was at fault. Let's see. Not according to the covenant mm -hmm. that I made with their fathers in the day, when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, mm -hmm. because they continued not in my covenant, right. and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. So now we want to take... Exodus 6 verse 4 to 5 and bearing in mind where he said that now there is a more excellent ministry but we want to see uh, what covenant was that made with the children of Israel we want to see Exodus 6 verse 4 verse 4 mm -hmm. and I've also established my covenant with them right. to give them the land of Canaan are we together brethren what was the covenant was the land of Canaan mm -hmm. okay what else the land of their pilgrimage, mm -hmm. wherein they were strangers. Right. And I've also heard the groaning of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians keep in bondage, and I have remembered my covenant. So, can I just, can I just make a, a, a question there now? It says, um, <clears throat> this, is, he was this is Exodus, right? So he was talking to the children of Israel, walking out of Egypt. But he says, I have established my covenant. He established my covenant, right? And to give them the land of Canaan. But in verse 5 he says, And I have remembered my covenant. Mm. How can you remember something that is made afresh? Can you remember something that's made afresh? Meaning that there's, this covenant was sounded before the children of Israel. So when we read the scriptures it says, 
Abraham kept my charge and kept my statutes. This covenant is not new. This covenant was with Abraham. Abraham was told that he was to be given a land. But did he see it? Hebrews 9, tells, Hebrews 9 or 11 tells us that he sojourned by faith, looking for a land whose builder and maker was God. But did he find it? No. Jacob, did he find it? So this is what we want to see now then. What, what, what characterized the covenant and what characterized the ministry? We want to see what are we left in this, in this time. Because many sermons have been made, some without the Spirit of God, and which has beclouded our mind to make it think that the statutes, the feasts, the animal sacrifice was the one which was the covenant. But no, we need to see. We need to separate them bit by bit. When God gave these things, he didn't give them all at once. He separated and he, he, he proper distinguished that this is the covenant. This is the ministry. So we want to see for our own safety, what did God give? So now that we've seen the, the covenant, we want to see if this covenant came with the ministry. Let's go to Exodus 25, verse 8. Verse 8. And let them make me a sanctuary, mm -hmm. that I may dwell among them, mm -hmm. according to all that I shew thee, after the pattern of the tabernacle, and the pattern of all these instruments thereof, even so shall he make it. Right. So again, I bring the subject that we always combine the two, ministry and covenant. Here, this is not saying anything about the covenant. This is saying, you shall build a sanctuary for me. Yeah? And this sanctuary was to cleanse the people of God. But it wasn't a, just a, a thought that God made. It was a pattern with heaven. So meaning that even heaven themselves, they separate the two, the ministry and the covenant. One is for the other, but one was not fault, uh, was, was faultless. Let's, let's go on and read Exodus 29 before we get back to Hebrews 8. Exodus 29, verse 26. And thou shalt offer every day a bullock for a sin offering for atonement. Mm -hmm. And thou shalt cleanse the altar when thou hast made an atonement for it. Mm -hmm. And thou shalt anoint it to sanctify it. Mm -hmm. Seven days shall thou make an atonement for the altar and sanctify it. It shall be an altar most holy. Whatsoever toucheth the altar shall be holy. Now, this is that which thou shalt offer upon the altar, mm -hmm. two lambs of the first year, day by day continually. Mm -hmm. The one lamb thou shalt offer in the morning, and the other lamb thou shalt offer at even. Did he say anything about the land of Canaan in here? He did not. This is something holy separately. This is a ministry that God gave to cleanse the people. So now we want to go back to... Yeah, let's go back to Hebrews 8 and finish off learning about this new covenant. Hebrews chapter 8. Verse 10. Verse 10. For this is the covenant mm -hmm. that I will make with the house of Israel after right. those days. After which days? After which days? This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after which days? Firstly, in, in the, before we, we went on to off track to Exodus, we're reading that God will make a what? A new excellent ministry. Do you see that? And this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. Meaning that the ministry is to be put before this covenant is established. Why do I say so? Um, the children of Israel... They, they left Egypt for a journey that could have taken nearly a week. But for 40 years, they were in the wilderness. What were they doing? They were partaking of this ministry. This ministry was in full effect. Seven days they were doing this ministry before they entered the land of Canaan. So meaning that this ministry must be in full effect before the land of Canaan. So even in our time as well, this new excellent ministry which has no earthly uh, sac sacrifices, but the sacrifices are us, the believers. This excellent ministry is to be put in full effect before the promised land has come. If we have this thought, when we read these next verses, it will make sense to us now what the new covenant is. Verse 11. Verse 11. Mm -hmm. And they shall not teach every so, man his sorry, neighbor. Verse 10. Sorry. Verse 10. Verse 10. For this is the covenant that I will make with those, with the house of Israel after those days. Say the Lord, I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. Mm -hmm. And I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. 
-hmm. Verse 11. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor, mm -hmm. and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. So if we're in the new covenant now, why is there a need for me to be standing preaching today? Do you understand? We are not yet in the new covenant. We have the covenant before us, but we are now in the new ministry, the new excellent ministry, not in the covenant, in the ministry. So this is why the devil often uh, beclouds our uh, understanding of what the new covenant is. Because if we do not understand what period we're in now, we cannot see the new covenant. We'll be thinking that, no, we are just waiting for the pearly gates where, the, where the, the law is written in our hearts already. The law is in our hearts already. So we do not need the law. Mm -hmm. But what we are doing there, we are shunning the new excellent ministry that will make us ready for the new covenant. Mm -hmm. So we need to open our eyes, brethren, and really see what is this new ministry. Because without the new ministry, we cannot be saved. People in the wilderness, the children of Israel, the, the over 20s at the gate of Canaan, the Korahs and the Datans, they failed before this ministry of God in the wilderness. And they did not see Canaan. So in this time, we need to pass on the part of the ministry first before we get to the new covenant. So let's see now. Have we had finished Hebrews 8? We're on verse 12. Mm -hmm. So let's read verse, verse, 12. verse 12. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, mm -hmm. and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Mm -hmm. And that he saith, a new covenant he hath made with, he had made the first old. Mm -hmm. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old mm -hmm. is ready to vanish away. Right. So now we've established now that this, the covenant and the ministry are two separate things. So now we want to see, because right now, the thing that's most important to us is the ministry. The covenant we all know, even those who do not have any religion know that people are looking forward to heaven. People are looking forward to something great at the end. So that is not too significant for us now. But what the thing that most people do not know is this new excellent ministry. So let's pry into it a little bit just to see what characterizes it. Desire of Ages, page 656.5. 656.5. And partaking with his disciples of the bread and wine, mm -hmm. Christ pledged himself to them as their redeemer. Can we just stop on that point one second? This is Christ, right? So meaning this is after the cross, after the passing away of the old covenant. Do we see that? After the passing away of the what? The old covenant. So it says, in partaking of, uh, with his disciples of the bread and wine, Christ pledged himself to them as their redeemer. We know Christ himself right now is the high priest of this new excellent ministry. So in partaking of the bread and wine, Christ pledges to be our Redeemer. Meaning that this ministry needs the bread and wine. Let's go on. He committed. He committed to them the new covenant. Right. By which all who receive him become the children of God. And, and joint heirs with Christ. Do we see this? By sitting down with his disciples, brethren, Christ made himself the, their redeemer. He pledged to be their redeemer. And by that it says, all receive Christ as the children of God and become joint heirs with Christ through the bread and wine. But if you do not understand really the law of God at this moment of time, or as the common statement is that we don't need the law of God anymore. If we do not have that, we cannot pledge ourselves to be the children of God. Because without the ceremonial law, do we know when to take the bread and wine? Do we know when to take the bread and wine? Without a comprehension of the ceremonial law, do we know? We don't know. So we need this for us to be saved. Let's read on. It says, by this covenant. By this covenant, mm -hmm. every blessing that heaven could bestow for this life mm -hmm. and the life to come right. was theirs. This covenant did was to be ratified with the blood of Christ. Brothers and sisters, are we getting this? Are we getting this? Are we together, please? Tell me. Comment there. Tell me. Are we together? Yes or no? By taking the bread and wine, he committed the new covenant. And by committing this new covenant, this is the covenant that gives us all the blessings in this life 
and the life to come. That's what the scripture tells us. In this life and the life to come. It says, the taking of the bread and wine with his disciples was the covenant deed. Brethren, it does not get clearer than this. The bread and wine is what we need. We have heard about the, the daily, of its benefits of health. That's only a portion of it. Everything else that we need. Let's say, today I want a new job. If I have faith in this bread and wine, it's mine. I want to go to heaven. If I have faith in the bread and wine, it's mine. This is the covenant deed which gives us all the blessings that we need in this life. The bread and the wine is the covenant deed. Let's read on. This covenant deed yes. was to be ratified with the blood of Christ. Uh -huh. And the administration of the sacrament uh -huh. was to keep before the disciples the infinite sacrifice made for each of them individually brethren, as part of the great war of fallen brethren, humanity. Brethren, brethren, please, Amen. please, 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 please. We must be on the same page on this. Do you see how important just taking the bread and wine is? Mm. I will read this one again for you. And it says, this covenant deed was to be ratified by the blood of Christ. So when you take the bread and wine, it, puts, it takes its authority from the stamp ratified by Christ's blood. Yeah? And it says, and the administration of the bread and wine was to keep before the disciples the infinite sacrifice made for each individually. Earlier we read a scripture that says, no one is saved unless they have a personal uh, experience with Christ's things. Without taking the bread and wine, it is not complete. We do not have a personal experience with Christ without taking the bread and wine. Do you see how important it is? Let's go on to, there's just a short line that's there. It's GC 417. The cleansing. 417. Mm -hmm. The cleansing, both in the typical and in the real service, right. must be accomplished with blood. Right. So, <laughs> We want to be cleansed, right? We know we are, we, are, we are filthy beings. We want to go to heaven and sing with, with sinless beings. But it says the cleansing, both in the typical and in the real service, must be accomplished by blood. The scripture that we read in DA said that the taking of the bread and wine is ratified by the blood of Christ. So what other um, strategy do we have to allow ourselves to be cleansed by blood other than the taking of bread and, bread and wine? What, what else do we have? There's nothing else that we can say that this water represents the, the, the death of Christ. Let's take it and be saved. Nothing. But the bread and wine, we know that is the body and the blood of Christ. These two agencies are the ones that allow us to be cleansed, both in this, both for us here in this part of the, the world and in the start. Do you see how important it is, brethren? Let's continue to go on and build this puzzle. There's another scripture there, 421. Do you see again? 421. 421. So... In the new covenant, right. the sins of the repentant mm -hmm. are by faith placed upon Christ right. and transferred, in fact, to the whole heavenly sanctuary. So in the new covenant, by taking the bread and wine, our sins are transferred into heaven. Which is why Paul says, but now we have received a high priest of an even excellent ministry of a better covenant than the one before, that we are the sacrifices that our sins are taken directly to heaven. Imagine, directly to heaven and handled by Christ, who is appealing for us to God personally. But before we know Abraham, he killed and acted the role of an earthly priest in order to sacrifice to who? The heavenly priest. But now we have a direct line to the heavenly priest. Do you see how important that is? Let's go on. Uh, there's a track now that we want to look at from inspiration. From Behold Thy Mother, part two, says a little child. A little child mm -hmm. can see that when the animal sacrifice is pointing to him, seized on earth mm -hmm. at the death of Christ, mm -hmm. that he transferred all the sacrificial offerings to heaven right. and is a high priest of the heavenly ceremonial law. There's a heavenly ceremonial law. It is not banished. It's a heavenly ceremonial law. Why is a heavenly ceremonial law? We know that uh, in the Old Testament, the ceremonial law was conducted by an earthly priest. So now this ceremonial law is conducted in heaven. But is it abolished? No. Which is why it's very stunning to see people now who are advocating there's no need for the ceremonial law. 
just because we know that there's no more earthly sacrifices doesn't mean the times and the days are abolished. This is the working of the devil, brethren. Let us be careful because we can never be saved by this new excellent ministry without appearing at the appointed times for our salvation and cleansing. Let's read on. Have we finished that one? The sacrificial offerings to heaven and is a high priest of the heavenly ceremonial law. Yes. Offering his blood according to the types of the, he of the earthly sanctuary mm -hmm. pattern shown to Moses in the mount. Do we see that? Let's, let's go on to... Um, there's another one called HST. October 2, 1844. Uh, Joshua Himes, uh, Signs of the Times. <clears throat> October 2. Page 71. Page 71. Not the least point will fail, either in the substance shadowed forth mm -hmm. or in the time mm -hmm. so definitely pointed out for the observance of the types. Okay. For God is an exact timekeeper. So in times past, we heard, in the old covenant, we heard that three times a year appear before the Lord. And on the morrow after the Sabbath, he shall wave an offering unto the priest. Uh, unto, unto God, the priest shall wave unto God. Um, but we know now that we are not doing any earthly sacrifices. But is that time taken away? God is an exact time keeper. Not in the substance to stretch to fall away. Not even in the substance or the types. It, the time stays remaining. Why is that? We know at the end, there is an antitypical worship. Who is the people of God? So now we know that there's no need for the time to be taken away because in that exact place in which God ordains, there's to be the even better sacrifices to be placed on that time. And in other scriptures, we know that it says that the reason why God, if I, if I could remember it, the reason why God selected these times of the feast is because it's most convenient for humankind at those times to appear unto God. And to those who do keep the, to, do, do keep the feast, we'll tell you that when the time for the feast comes, I feel homesick as ever. Because it is in our hearts that after a certain period of time, we need a refreshment. So that is why God placed those times. So why are those times taken off now just because the earthly sacrifices are taken away? When the even better ministry has been established. Let us be careful and discern the voice of the devil. Let's go on um, further with our study. DA again, 656. But uh, we, we, we've read that anyways. So let's go on um, to Galatians 3, verse 29. You want to go into the last, or should I say, towards the last segments of this, of this sermon. You want to see now, now with this covenant, what does it make you and me? That's what we want to see. Because we've, we've seen the new covenant. Now, what is the new life? What comes as an effect of this covenant? Galatians 3, verse 29. Verse 29. Verse 29. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. Right. Let's connect this again with DA656. It says, in partaking of the bread and wine, Christ made himself our redeemer. And in that action, we become joint heirs with Christ. Christ. Here, we are saying, if we be Christ, we are Abraham's seed. So now we know that this covenant actually was not established with the children of Israel. It was even there with Abraham. Abraham was told that I will give you a land. That's how it actually started. So Abraham, J uh, Isaac, Jacob, the children of Israel coming out of Egypt, Christ, the disciples, and us. We are now joined to that line of succession. We are now, as long as we take the bread and wine and we, we do this sacred sacrament, we are put into that line. As Abraham's seeds. So now, I have a question. Why does God want to make us in that line? It's a question that somebody can have. Why are we to be Abraham's seed? I know God made a promise with Abraham, but why specifically does he want us to be Abraham's seed? What's the purpose that he wanted for Abraham's seed? Colossia, uh, no, COL 290.1 Christ Object Lessons 290.1 the children of Israel were to occupy all the territory which God appointed them. Right. Those nations that rejected the worship and service of the true God were to be dispossessed. Mm -hmm. But it was God's purpose that 
by the revelation of his character through Israel, men should be drawn unto him. To all the world, the gospel invitation was to be given. So, in the, in the Old Covenant, we know that, of course, this is the children of Israel as relatives, of course, coming from the same person, Jacob. They were moving into a land where they were to be established as a people. And to the common eye, it looks just like a family, you know, moving to a new land. But there was a purpose that God wanted. He says, but, he said, those nations that rejected the worship and service of the true God were to be dispossessed. But it was God's purpose that by the revelation of his character through Israel, men should be drawn unto him. Is that not the same purpose he has today? Is that not the same purpose he has today? The only difference is that when time went on, the children of Israel at that time, they start to lack and to, to discontinue that work that God wanted for them to do. If you read, Joshua was at the time the only person who done his part. The rest of Israel were content with the small portion of land that they had seen. But their actual job was to go to the, all the nations, just like the disciples, and they were to draw people in to the knowledge of God. But of course, the diversity of, of generations come in, the diversity of nations through intermarriage came in, and that, that work was discontinued. But this is the same purpose he has for us today. He wants us, <clears throat> at the end of the kingdom, we know that there's to be a kingdom established in which Abraham, who was promised the land, is to be seen in that kingdom before the millennium. Do you see that? And that kingdom is to expand its borders across the whole world. We'll read the scripture tells us that. But this is the purpose he has for us today. This is why he seeks for us, even though we are not Israel by blood, to come into line with what he had promised with Israel of the real. Let's read on. And see what else still. Through the teaching. Through the teaching of the sacrificial, sacrificial service, mm. Christ was to be uplifted before the nation. Right. And all who would look unto him should yeah. live. Right. All who, like Rahab the Canaanite, mm -hmm. and Ruth the Moabites, turned from idolatry to the worship of the true God, were to unite themselves with his chosen people. Mm -hmm. As the numbers of Israel increased, they were to enlarge their borders until their kingdom should embrace the world. This was God's purpose, brethren. This is what he wanted, that a gathering process should happen. But, as we said before, diversity of situations caused that not to happen. But now, we're given the chance to enter into a kingdom in which Gentiles and other people are to come in to build this nation before the millennium, it's a privilege that we have, which is why we need to comprehend this new excellent ministry, PK 293.1. 293. God's favor toward Israel had always been conditional on their obedience. Do you hear that? God's favor to Israel was conditional to their obedience. Let's read on. At the foot of Sinai, mm. they'd entered into covenant relationship with him right. as his peculiar treasure above all people. Mm -hmm. Solemnly, they'd promised to follow in the path of obedience. All that the Lord hath spoken, we will do, they said. Mm -hmm. And in Exodus chapter 19, verse 5 and 8, And when a few days afterward, God's law was spoken from Sinai, an additional instruction in the form of statutes and judgments was communicated through Moses. Right. The Israelites with one voice had again promised all the words which the Lord had said we will do. <laughs> again, we see the formula again put out in front of us. The, 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 their being, God's people, were conditional on their obedience. But how are they going to be obedient? The answer that God gives is the statutes, the judgments. Do you see that? The, so obedience is conditional on statutes and judgments. Do you see that? We can't be obedient to God without things that will govern us. That's a lie. Because what the judgment tells us? A man shall not lie with beast. So if we do not know that, are we God's peculiar treasure? Doing such sinful acts. Do you see? So obedience, it cannot be given. It's not something within you. 
It needs something for you to be obedient to in order to prove that you are God's peculiar people. So in this time, if he wants to carry out this same purpose with us, there's a need for these things, clearly. And when we are given these things, strict obedience is required in trade. Let's go on further. PK 713.1. 713. Mm -hmm. We've heard this so many times, but we're going to read it again. PK 713. That which God purposed to do for the world, mm -hmm. through Israel, the chosen nation, he will finally accomplish through his church on earth today. The purpose is ours, brethren. Who wants to who wants to be a part of the people who have finally accomplished the long-standing purpose of God? I know I do. Let's read on. He has let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, even to his covenant-keeping people, who faithfully render him the fruits in their seasons. Never has the Lord been without true representatives on this earth who have made his interest their own. Right. These witnesses for God mm -hmm. are numbered among the spiritual Israel, and to them will be fulfilled all the covenant promises made by Jehovah to his ancient people. Just the faithful taking of bread and wine changes an African to being spiritual Israel. Do you see that such transformation? Do you see such transformation? Comprehend it. It will take you from wherever walks of life you come from into being spiritual Israel. Do you see how important it is? But all it takes is to take the bread and wine in faith. That's all that God requires of us. But the devil has seen it and has caused us to have a wrong conception of these things. But nevertheless, God will have a people who explain this in every age. MH405. 405. We are numbered with Israel. Right. All the instruction given to the Israelites of old concerning the education and training of their children, all the promises of blessing through obedience are for us. So all the promises, every single covenant, circumcision is for us. The statutes, they are for us. Everything you may name, Sabbath, it is for us. Everything that was given to God's agent people is for us today. So that we can be ready when God says it is time to accomplish my purpose. He has a peculiar people. So now, if we are Israel today, if we know that in, in, today, in today's day, the, the God's people are us. Then let's take a look. I have a question. I have something we want to look at. In the tribes, we know in, in Revelation 7, in the gathering of the 144,000, we are called children of Israel, from every tribe. It's not saying uh, these are the Christians. No, it says the people of God from Dan 7,000, 12,000. This is what we were given. So amongst those tribes now, if we dish them out to each other, why is the tribe of Dan missing? I want to see that. I want to see why is it missing and what characterizes the tribe of Dan? We know, if you want to read in your own time, in Genesis 49, the tribe of Dan is there. But in in Revelation 7, it is not there. And why is that? You want to read it. There's a specific purpose or a, a specific description that God has for these people. Let's go on and read. It's another track from Inspiration. Maccabre 3. It says, well, the tribe of Dan. The tribe of Dan mm -hmm. is a monument to the exceeding great mercy of God in the time of the final judgment upon Israel and the world. Right. We said we are Israel of today, right? So amongst us as a people, there's a tribe called Dan. But the scripture says they are a monument to the exceeding great mercy of God. When you see this tribe of Dan, you just think of the mercy of God. So start to think, what type of people can these people be? Let's read on. Dan. Dan came to be regarded as the black sheep. Mm -hmm. The house of Jacob, of the house of Jacob, his name is associated with the blasphemer of Leviticus 24, with Samson, the judge of the tribe of Dan, faithless to his Nazarene vow, and with one of the places of idol worship with the northern kingdom of Israel. It says Dan was regarded as the black sheep. And it says his name, the tribe of Dan, is associated with the blasphemer in the time of the Leviticus. And also, 
it was his name Samson so again we see what type of a people in this day and age or in, in our time what type of a people are comprehended as the black sheep or as the most sinful of people let's take that in mind let's read on two golden two golden calves a bullock and a heifer mm. were placed in Bethel and Dan in the places of worship for the ten tribes right Dan was a hater of Joseph because he brought an evil report to his father against the sons of Zilpah and Bilhah and plotted to take his life. He was a known idolater in the time of Abraham, mm. Moses, and Balaam. So, we, so we're seeing that Dan was a, a, it was a tribe which was characterized with a lot of um, blasphemy. But still, two golden calves were placed for worship for the ten tribes in Dan. Shall we move in, the, in the, the timeline a little bit? Let's pick that up and place it to the end. If there's a tribe of Dan in our day, are there golden calves placed in that tribe for the worship of the ten tribes? Answer that personally. Let's go on. His name is omitted from the twelve tribes mm -hmm. sealed in Revelation 7, right. but suffices unexpectedly in the ninth verse as well as in Ezekiel 48, where he receives the first portion in the north of the new division in the land of Israel. So we know even in the new land of Israel, at the end of the world, we know that there was going to be portions uh, devoted to each people, each tribe. So Dan is said to, uh, to establish themselves as the very first tribe to inherit that land. Do we take, do we take notes of these things? That first, they are despised people. Secondly, they have been given the, as the place where the other tribes are to be uh, spiritually nourished. Then, again, they are omitted amongst the saved 144,000. Do you see that? And then after that, they are the ones to accomplish the very first portion of land in the new Jerusalem. Do you see all these traits? They're not corresponding. But we want to see why are all of these coming into place. Let's read on. Jacob's blessing of Dan, in which is compared to a serpent in Genesis 49, verse 16 to 18, mm. is referred to Samson from the tribe of Dan, mm. and which was made an emblem of the tribe on its standard. Still further, is the identification of the serpent and the lion in Genesis 49 and Deuteronomy 33. Right. Hence, the lion with a serpent's tail the emblem of the tribe of Dan is based in scripture by divine wisdom. Mm -hmm. How? How this tribe could be redeemed and translated to the heavenly Canaan is the mystery into which angels desire to look. Do you see this? If we look in the world, it says how this tribe, this people will be saved is a mystery not only for humans, but even angels desire to look into it. But no, man. How are these people saved? Not only saved, but saved first. It's a mystery that God has. So whoever this tribe of Dan will be in the last days will be a monument of God's mercy. But what we want to see, though, not focusing on the tribe of Dan much, we want to comprehend the fact that it all takes a new covenant. It all takes the bread and wine. This is what God has for us in these last days. It's not rocket science as people would make it look like. It's a simple, um, how can I put it? It's a simple, just taking what you've been told, not what you think yourself. Because in this world, it's very common to just live without a law and without restriction. It's very common to live without a law and restriction. But God has placed in his word, his remedy for us to be saved. Luther. He walks thinking that if I step my foot exactly where Christ stepped, I can be saved. But no, what God wanted to show him is, it's not the physical step you need, but the spiritual step you need. This is what will save us, brethren. That if we comprehend this new excellent ministry, we will be saved in the last days. So, from wherever you're watching, I hope you've been blessed throughout the whole programs of BSN TV this day. And this short sermon was just to... Just add a boost onto what we learned in this morning that 
The daily is exactly what we say it is. The daily is important, not only to health, but as the scripture says, every blessing of this life and of the life to come. May God bless you all. And from the week that we have, I wish it is successful. God bless.